Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to another Outstanding Authors at Google Talk. Um, we're very pleased to host today Larry Downs, who is an expert on the intersection of technology and law. Um, you may know him from his um, previous book, which is um, Unleashing the Killer App, which was distributed in a sort of open source web posting type um, distribution back in 1998. I'm very revolutionary for its day. Um, he is a partner at the Bell Mason Group, and he, as I said, he's authored numerous books on the intersection of technology and law. Um, Larry also makes his way across the uh, grad school teaching circuit, so he has appointments at the Chicago GSB, the Haas School, as well as the Northwestern School of Law. And currently, he's down the road at Stanford. I'm working with the uh, Center for Internet and Society. Um, today, he'll be speaking to us on a very core topic, um, the laws of disruption, harnessing the forces that govern the, the business and, and life in the digital age. Um, as the internet continues to revamp the ways we um, do business and organize society, um, Larry offers, some, offers us some guideposts from the past in terms of how to deal with these um, changes and, and disruptions. And he also will give us anecdotes as to what happens when we don't react to them properly. Now, um, you may think for a person like Larry, there's a lot of weighty issues um, you know, on, on his mind all the time, things that may keep him up at, at night. Um, but when asked in an interview um, from the Haas Center over at Berkeley, um, he want, um, wondered um, what keeps Larry up at night. Um, in this case, it's his um, dog who is kept up at night by the raccoons, which in turn sort of spreads throughout the house. So that's the um, primary concern, not, not net neutrality um, or, or another um, weighty issue. Um, so please use the Q&A mic to ask any questions that you may have um, towards the end of our talk for the benefit of our YouTube and virtual audiences. And without further ado, um, please join me in welcoming Larry Downs. Uh, thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be, uh, to be back at Google talking about the, the new book. Uh, I want to sort of just suggest how I got involved with this idea in the first place. Uh, one of the things that uh, I like to do to try and keep current with technology, which of course is pretty much impossible these days, but I like to look at as many different sources as I can for information. So I read both from sort of business press and mainstream press as well as technology press. And when I find something I like, I just you know, kind of print it out and put it aside in a pile. One of the things that I noticed over the last couple of years was that more and more of the stories that I was clipping out were in fact stories about the relationship between technological development, particularly obviously information technology, uh, and the law or legal systems, regulators, courts, uh, 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 lawmakers, administrative law, and so on. And most of those stories were bad news. They were mostly stories about how things weren't working uh, and how they were, these conflicts were becoming bigger and more expensive uh, between the legal system and the technological applications that were being developed uh, in very rapid order. And uh, as I started collecting more and more of these stories, I thought, well, there, there's something going on. I'm not quite sure what it is, but clearly something interesting. And um, the one that sort of now got me to be the kind of the aha moment was, now I'm talking about the earlier privacy flap uh, at uh, Facebook. There have been now two since the one I'm going to talk about, uh, including uh, yesterday when, when Mark Zuckerberg announced that privacy he didn't think was all that important. Um, so proving that if, any, if, if there is a company that has worse public relations and government relations than you, uh, it's <laughs> Facebook. Uh, but the first one, if you may remember, this was back in, in early 2009, February, I think, of 2009, um, when uh, a sort of weird kind of rebellion emerged. So what happened was that uh, Facebook made uh, what actually turns out from a legal standpoint was a very modest and very minor change to the terms of service dealing with uh, information licenses that uh, the company uh, expected of the users, particularly after they left the site. And you know, this is, it has, it typically happens in large technology companies. Uh, what I presume happened was the lawyers you know, wrote the change, the change you know, went through the regular process. It seems unlikely it's the kind of change that was normally even gone through a kind of an executive team review. It was, as I say, pretty, pretty modest uh, legal stuff. And uh, they, posted the, you know, they posted a notice saying we've made a change to our terms of service. Well, you know, it's Facebook. There's 800 zillion people. And so as it turns out, somebody actually read it. And it turns out, I think, that the person who read it probably wasn't a lawyer, didn't understand exactly what he read, but the language was disturbing uh, to them. And of course, this is one of the problems with terms of service agreements is that they're intentionally written to be unreadable, uh, even by lawyers. Uh, they're they're uh, often their cut and paste jobs and uh, 
one of the exercises I often do with my, um, my law students and my non-law students is just pick at random terms of service agreement and print it out and actually read it. And you know, how many times there are typographical errors, uh, terms that are sort of you know, capitalized but never defined anywhere. Uh, they're, they're, they're really quite bad documents and frankly, it doesn't matter because you know, 99 point XXX percent of the time, if something goes wrong in the relationship between the user of a service and the service, uh, the reference is back to that document doesn't happen, right? I mean, it gets, gets resolved other ways. You know, in, the, in the interest of good customer service, we're going to do X or Y or Z. Regardless of what the terms of service say we can or will do, uh, generally speaking, we don't go back to that document unless things go really, really wrong. Uh, so that's particularly probably why you know, nobody really paid much attention to this. But as I say, somebody read it, uh, misread it, I think, but uh, thought that it suggested that, uh, that Facebook was, was taking additional rights uh, without compensation for those rights. And of course, this being Facebook, the way they responded was by creating a Facebook page called Facebook Users Against the New Terms of Service. Uh, and within a couple hours, there were 100,000 members of that page. Now, for Facebook, 100,000 members isn't really very much, frankly. Uh, but it was enough to scare the hell out of Facebook and uh, particularly because, of course, the mainstream media picked up on it. All these really embarrassing headlines, you know, Facebook falls on its face, you know, that sort of stuff happened pretty quickly. And a number of really interesting things happened immediately after that. First of all, um, Mark Zuckerberg announced that they were going to withdraw, the, that the changes were being withdrawn. So the changes to terms of service, those disappeared immediately. Uh, and more importantly, he made this announcement that he said, look, in the future, uh, we're going to treat the terms of services in a very different way. So first of all, we're going to write it in plain language. Uh, of course, whatever natural language the, the audience uh, prefers, but let's just for now call it English. We're going to write it in English. And in the future, anytime we want to make a significant change to the document, uh, we're going to institute a, a process that will kind of try to introduce some form of democracy or at least deliberation among the user community uh, before we actually implement the change. Uh, and one of the things in, that happened in the, in the, the later change to the privacy policy, which of course blew up in their face uh, a couple of months ago, was that they actually circulated the proposed changes according to this new process, but I think because it wasn't really uh, well advertised, they weren't, they, there's a trigger point to get a vote on a change to the terms of service. You have to have so many users uh, respond that they want to vote, and it didn't meet that threshold, so it never went through a vote. And then, of course, you know, following their procedure in October, November, whenever it was that they introduced the new privacy policy, lo and behold, of course, uh, the, the world blows up uh, a second time for them. Um, so, but, but I thought that this was really an important moment. And one of the things I thought in particular that, uh, that Facebook recognized was that in an online community, and particularly uh, one as large as they are, uh, there is a sort of sense that this is uh, not a country, but some kind of of a social organization, obviously it's a social network, it's some kind of social organization that has laws, that has rules, that has in some sense a government uh, around it. And one of the things I think that was interesting was that they realized that when you have uh, the terms of service, uh, for better or for worse, becomes effectively the, the constitution of that, that community. So that's the governing, the main sort of governing document that determines the rights and obligations, the responsibilities between the sovereign, in this case Facebook, and the citizens, in this case the 300, 400, 500 million users. And that obviously as you move the technology from, you know, buying and selling cars or, you know, trading on futures and commodities to some place where people are actually coming to interact with each other and to form relationships and to become, uh, you know, in some ways digital citizens, the idea that in this case, you know, you would have a document that simply enforced and forced upon the community without any deliberation, without any representation. So, I mean, it's essentially, it's a, it, was a, it was a form of tyranny. And this sort of rebellion, this 100,000 people rebellion, was kind of the beginnings of a recognition that uh, the, the governance of digital life uh, was going to have to take on uh, a much less tyrannical and a much more democratic look uh, because otherwise, you know, what happens when you have people who are governed by do a government that they don't, they didn't elect, that they don't feel represented by, and they don't like? Well, you have revolution. Uh, and 
revolution, I think, was the thing in the back of their minds at Facebook that, that, that got them to react as quickly as they did, not necessarily effectively, but certainly quickly. And that's because what, what is the value of Facebook? I mean, you go uh, to their offices, right? You look, you know, there's no gold bullion, there's no factories, there's no manufacturing. The entire balance sheet, the entire asset of the company is information, much like it is for you. And in their case, all the information they have, or at least all the valuable information they have, is provided by the users. So if the users are unhappy, uh, this is not like a regular country. If they say, well, we don't like the government, it's really, you know, I'm not going to pick up and move, well, I might go to Canada, but um, it's not, you know, it's 200 million people just can't pick up and move somewhere. Well, of course, online they can. Uh, it's not easy, uh, but it's much easier than it would be in the real world, and they could move to Facebook or to MySpace or LinkedIn or somewhere else if they didn't like the, the government that they were getting uh, from Facebook. Uh, and of course, the minute they leave the company, it doesn't exist anymore. There is literally nothing there without the users and without the information that those users provide. So this was the moment when I said, okay, I think now I get what all those stories I was clipping out, what they all add up to. Uh, and what they add up to is, to me, a sense that um, we've now kind of progressed far enough in internet life, these are 10 years that we've been developing applications and services for the internet, that we've moved into this world where instead of just talking about you know, business to business or business to consumer, and even consumer to consumer, it's now really moving into a, a much more interesting and intimate set of interactions, social relationships, uh, economic relationships, and so on, that we now have to start thinking about a second life or a digital life that we lead and what the government of that digital life or what the, the not only the constitution but then all the laws that go with that to uh, set you know, the, the, the specific terms of interactions, uh, what that's going to look like. And one of the things that's clearly not going to look like is uh, the sort of law that we have in, in the physical world. Uh, many of the stories I clip suggest that the way in which we interact in our digital lives is so different than the way we do things in physical life that trying to apply the, the metaphors, trying to apply the, the legal s assumptions and trying to use the legal institutions, you know, courts and legislatures, very slow, very deliberate, very expensive, very methodical. Uh, that just sort of set of institutions is an extremely poor fit for the, the kinds of problems and the, the quantity of problems that we experience now as we develop this digital life. And um, I know a little bit about uh, digital life. As, I, as Cliff mentioned, I've been uh, writing in this space in particular for uh, many years. My, my first book, The Killer App Book, uh, this was kind of looking at how the internet was going to affect businesses. I didn't say much about consumers. I certainly didn't say much about social systems because it was very early on, this is 1997 when I was writing, uh, predicting that, uh, you know, even then it wasn't a really too far out there prediction. Certainly now it seems completely cliche, but my prediction in 1997 was the internet is going to significantly change the way people do business. Okay, well, great. That, um, that, that was maybe interesting in 1997. It's obviously uh, not so interesting to talk about today. But I thought one of the models that I'd come up with there was going to be, I thought, useful in talking about now, 10 years later, how is law going to evolve, both in the physical world, but more importantly, uh, in this new world, what is the legal system and how is it going to develop? And indeed, how, what should we be doing to make sure that it develops in the best, most efficient, most democratic, most whatever you know, your set of values is for that? How can we make sure that that happens as quickly and as efficiently as possible? One of the models that I liked uh, from the original book was this sort of recognition, uh, looks very scientific, this isn't the least bit scientific, uh, but that the fact is that when you have a disruptive technology, uh, it's one where the pace at which it changes things is faster than the ability of the underlying people or businesses or social systems to respond to it. In fact, that's sort of my definition of a disruptive technology. It's one where the, its ability to change uh, outstrips the capacity for change of the people who are affected by it. So you've got, on the one hand, you know, you've sort of got you know, we'll just stick with digital technology. You've got it changing, and we'll talk about why in a second, uh, at this uh, essentially geometric or exponential pace. Those of us, you know, in the real world, if you can think about, you know, how you adapt to change, uh, it's not exponential, right? We're much slower at it, and our institutions are much slower at it. And I thought that the problem or, or the opportunity in Killer App 
was that somewhere in that gap between kind of the preferred rate of change and the potential rate of change, companies could come in, introduce new products or services, and upset old supply chains, upset old sets of relay, very stable industries could be destabilized. All of these things were possible just by moving a little bit more quickly than everybody else. Well, obviously that's what's happened. Uh, again, not, not, a, not a, you know, brilliant uh, prediction on my part, but at least I tried to put it into some terminology. Uh, and the terminology I used was the law of disruption, where I said that in this case, when you have disruptive or digital technologies changing exponentially, uh, but you have social, legal, and, and economic systems changing incrementally, you are going to have a kind of set of problems. You're going to have a set of, of interactions that are going to prove to be disruptive. You're going to have these accidents uh, somewhere in the intersection uh, between the two. And so I pulled the law of disruption from the old book and I said, all right, now it's 10 years later. Certainly the business systems have changed. How about the legal system? What, what, what's happening now? Law is sort of historically when you look at disruptive technology, law is always the last of these systems to change. It's always the place where people retreat to to try and hold back change as much as they can. But eventually law goes through the sort of same kind of significant transformation that we've now observed over the last 10 years, let's say in business. And in fact, I think you'll, you will clearly see uh, over the next 10 years kind of a revolution in how we even think about our legal institutions and our legal systems similar to the way we've had uh, over the previous 10 years in business and industry and, and the economy in particular, the information economy that we've developed. All right, so this is the part where in a regular audience I would spend the next 10 minutes talking about why digital technology is disruptive. I think I can probably skip that. Um, for you guys, Moore's Law, Metcalf's Law, put them, so I'll do it very, very quickly. Moore's Law, Metcalf's Law, put them together, you have a disruptive change. The pace of change, uh, obviously, I I if you sort of think digital technology changes uh, along the same path as Moore's Law, put that together with Metcalf's Law, put that together with the weird information uh, economics where information is not a scarce good. The more it's used, the more valuable it is. It doesn't get used up. It has its own economic. Put all that together and you get a recipe for uh, now, 10 years of disruption, but certainly uh, many more decades to come. I have this wonderful story I tell to make this concrete. Again, I don't need to go over this with you, but I say if you take the first commercially sold computer, that's the Univac 1, 1955, if you gave that a, a, a unit measurement of one, you said a, a Univac is one computing power, and even though Moore's Law, of course, didn't exist in 1955, let's just pretend it did and we apply it uh, and we start running Moore's Law, to the year 2000, uh, and you said a Sony PlayStation 2, which debuted in 2000, would be very rough measurements here, but roughly equivalent in computing power to 22 million Univac 1s. Uh, if you wanted to buy 22 million Univac 1s, in 1955, you would need an amount of money that, that, ex that exceeds the GDP of the United States in the year 2000, not adjusted for inflation. Obviously, the PlayStation 2 is much smaller and cheaper and faster than 22 million Univacs, and also, interestingly enough, was not made for you know the Univac one, you know, high speed, you know, big applications, lots of number crunching. Uh, the first one was sold, in fact, to General Electric for payroll systems and other accounting systems. Obviously, the PS2 is made for something a little bit different. Um, but when you start, you know, continue to double a number, when you start with a small number, the several uh, initial doublings aren't very interesting. Keep doubling the big number now, and every ex next generation of change gets that much more disruptive because you're doubling a bigger number. And so if you run this forward uh, to the present, take the PlayStation 2, say that's 20 min 22 million Univacs. To store them, you would need a space about equal to the city of Seattle, Washington, um, not stacking them, just laying them end to end. Uh, if you move forward to 2005, that's only five years now, not 50 years. 2005, the PlayStation 3, again, rough, uh, rough MIPS measurements, 660 million Univacs. So you've gone from 22 to 660 in five years. Uh, cost pretty much stays the same. Uh, size, you know, get, get the, the pro chip at least size gets smaller and smaller. And if you wanted to store 660 million Univac 1s, uh, you would need about the entire state of Washington uh, just to put them somewhere in the box that the PlayStation 3 goes. And the amount of money you would need to buy 660, mi six, 666 million Univac 1s in 1955 would be more than the entire money supply of the world today. So you just literally, it wouldn't have been possible uh, it, to do it. All right, so that's, the, I just ran through that in, usually I take about 15 minutes with that. All right, so, so we understand that it's disruptive. And I think it's clear that the legal 
the, the, the sort of legal institutions and legal systems are now feeling the pressure of change uh, that everything else, all our other systems have been feeling much more directly in the sort of first 10 years. Uh, and one of the questions that I was asked when I started thinking about this book and started proposing it to publishers was, well, okay, great, this is, we love this. Now, your book's going to tell us, right, what the new legal system's going to look like and who are going to be the winners and the losers uh, five years from now. You're going to be able to lay all that out for us. And I said, no, I can't do that. I said, that's sort of like asking me, you know, the Wright brothers just took off at Kitty Hawk and you want to know, you know, will United or Southwest get better gate placement at Oakland Terminal 2 in 2000? I just, you know, it's, it's just, it's not possible. But I think it is important to try and find ways to predict. And to me, the most valuable tool for trying to see how something's going to happen is to find historical analogies, historical metaphors. Obviously, they're not perfect by definition, but I think they can be very useful. Uh, I like this quote very much from uh, Frederick Jameson, who's a literary critic. And he says, you know, if you really think about it, science fiction is a kind of nostalgia for the present. That the way people generally write about the future, it really isn't about the future, it's about the present. Uh, set in uh, sort of some other place or time in order to talk about things that you couldn't really talk about directly. So thinking about the future is not very useful in trying to predict the future. The past, I think, is a much better guide. Uh, and this quote I also love uh, from, uh, from, from, from Ronald Coase. Uh, any of my students will know my affection for Professor Coase, Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, who said, uh, if you torture the data enough, nature will always confess. Uh, and so again, trying to make predictions based on trends and future trends, you can make the predictions, but the, your tendency, even unconsciously, to skew the data or to interpret the data in a way that gets you the result you wanted to get is such that uh, it's not a very useful way of doing prediction. All right, so how better to do it? Uh, I like to say look at to historical examples. And for me, the be most useful way of predicting what's going to happen in this age of disruption is to look at the previous large-scale age of disruption. And for me, that would be the Industrial Revolution. You have some very similar characteristics. So the in, you think about the Information Revolution being powered by a semiconductor on their own. Computers don't do anything. They're kind of a machine that makes other machines. Very similarly, in the Industrial Revolution, you had a key technology, the steam engine. On its own, it didn't do anything, but it became the basis for manufacturing technology, transportation technology, communications technology. Uh, it was sort of the, the, the chip of its day. And in particular, I think it's useful to look at the Industrial Revolution from the standpoint of how uh, railroads developed. So that was one of the key technologies, or key applications, I should say, of the steam engine. What can we learn from how that affected legal systems in particular that might suggest how the semiconductor is going to design a new legal system uh, for us in our digital lives. Uh, and I love this. This is a map of the U.S. railroad system in the year 1900. Uh, you will observe something about it pretty obviously from the very beginning, which is there's all kinds of uh, congestion. And you think of this as competition in a business sense. There's all kinds of competition, uh, particularly in the Northeast and the Midwest. And uh, all pretty much until you get to the Mississippi River, if you're trying to ship from point A to point B, you have many, many choices, right? You have lots and lots of competition. But west of the Mississippi to the Pacific, you have many different routes, but each of those routes takes a slightly different path through what's known as the Intermountain region, the region between the Mississippi uh, and the West Coast. And this translated to a very, very significant social problem uh, in the year 1900, and that was that because the, the railroads in the congested part had to compete so viciously with each other. Uh, essentially, there was more capacity than anybody could possibly use uh, in the, the dark part of this chart that they were losing money. They were using huge, losing huge amounts of money on the transport up to the Mississippi. And the only way they could stay profitable was to make it up in the Inner Mountain region. And the way they did this was by charging you know, excessive rates of, of carriage to everybody that was stuck with only one line. So if you're living in Spokane, Washington, you have exactly one way of getting your timber to the Pacific or even back uh, to, to the Midwest, and that's the Great Northern Railroad. So the Great Northern Railroad said, Spokane, you're going to pay, <laughs> you're basically going to subsidize our losses everywhere else, and this is what all the transcontinental railroads did. Well, this in turn led to a tremendous amount of social unrest. 
Uh, so the progressive movement, the Granger movement, the socialist movement, many of these uh, industrial age sort of developments in terms of, of, uh, of calls for radical or some less radical changes to the way uh, law worked, to the way governments were run, uh, more or less came out of this particular feature of the railroad system. Uh, you, you know, squeeze people long enough, they're going to revolt. Uh, they revolted in a lot of different ways, some of them civil, some of them not so civil, some of them nonviolent, some of them violent. And the Granger movement in particular was twice, uh, trying to, to force Congress to pass laws that would make railroads behave more like governments. They said, look, the, the railroad is effectively a sovereign. Uh, we have no choice but to deal with them. They, they govern our, our behavior so significantly that they ought to be held to the same kinds of standards as a democratic uh, government. This is, you know, sounds like the Facebook story, right? Exactly the same thing. Um, they were successful in the United States, so just as an aside, they weren't, didn't work so well in, in uh, other parts of the world, right? The Russian Revolution in some ways was the violent equivalent of the Granger movement or the progressive movement, uh, where the workers simply took over uh, the means of production uh, and formed their own government. And by the way, the difference between how the West and how Russia resolved this industrial age problem, in some ways that determined the course of history for the next hundred years. But why in the United States in particular did it take a nonviolent form? Well, the answer is uh, largely Teddy Roosevelt uh, and uh, a group of his advisors. They were essentially, they were conservative. Uh, if you want to you know, put a political label on them, they were not radicals, they were not militants, but they recognized that there was enough pressure on the economic system because of the way the railroads were behaving that if there wasn't some valve to release that, there would in fact be the kind of violent revolution that ultimately took place in other parts of the world, and particularly in Russia. So Roosevelt essentially became a progressive. He became the great trust buster, uh, not because he was anti-business, but because he was uh, concerned that the alternative would be the complete collapse of, uh, of sort of the, the, uh, the, the government and the, the economic system of, of capitalism that was causing all this stress. And in particular, one of the, um, the principal's advi principal advisors to Roosevelt uh, on economic matter was a very strange man uh, named Brooks Adams. Brooks Adams, the uh, grandson of John Quincy Adams, the great grandson, sorry, the grandson of John Quincy Adams, the great grandson of John Adams. So from uh, the, this uh, you know, family of people who understood revolutions against tyrants uh, pretty well. Uh, by his generation, of course, the tyrant here was now uh, the railroads. Uh, and Adams uh, developed a theory which he used, in fact, in, uh, as a lawyer, he argued on behalf of the city of Spokane uh, in a case that eventually was decided by the Supreme Court, which did determine that the railroads were uh, unfairly discriminating economically against the, uh, the Intermountain region. Of course, that was a new legal principle that there could be such a thing as economic discrimination. Uh, and, uh, and, and Adams was sort of one of the people who spearheaded that theory. Uh, and this quote from his br brief in, uh, in to the Interstate Commerce Commission, I thought really summarized my sense of how uh, this relationship between uh, disruptive technology and legal systems is going to play out now a hundred years later. So he says, you can read it for yourself, he says, no ancient abstract principle of right and wrong which can safely be deduced as a guide to regulate the relations of railways and monopolies among our people because railways and monopolies are products of forces unknown in former times. The character of competition has changed and the law must change to meet it or collapse. Right? That, that's essentially uh, Roosevelt's view in a nutshell. If the law doesn't change uh, to meet these new forces, these new disruptive technologies, the law will simply fall apart. We will get a new legal system, but we won't get it in a very nice way. Um, and sure enough, I think that's, you know, th that sort of forms the basis of the theoretical part uh, of the book is this recognition that uh, we have these new forces, uh, the law is uh, ill-equipped to deal with them, the law is either going to change or collapse, and obviously the goal of, of the book is to try and suggest ways going forward in some of the most contentious areas today to make sure that it does change and doesn't collapse, or at least that the collapse is as orderly as possible uh, going forward. So this is just a short list, some of the, the kinds of issues that I cover in the book, but obviously these are some of the things that are, are kind of at the forefront of these conflicts now between the sort of body of law that we live under today uh, and the, the, the reality that technology has created in the last 10 years to which those simply don't fit. 
Uh, and I try to sort of draw, just to close out the in industrial age analogy, I said, look, I I if we're really talking about what happened, the Industrial Revolution driven by the steam engine, essentially there was a new law created. I mean, this case I mentioned is a, a big piece of it. There was lots of other things. But if you sort of took the whole progressive era uh, and what came out of it and put it all together, what you would say is that essentially the law changed dramatically over a 10, 20 year period. Uh, and really we went from essentially what was still kind of based in feudal society and feudal law, particularly in Europe and in some sense in the United States, where law was really organized around property ownership, real, real estate property ownership, and the relationship between the owners of property and people who lived on the property, so the tenants, the servants, the serfs, uh, the farm uh, community, and so on. Really what happened after the industrial age was that the legal system moved from kind of a feudal model based on property to a property model based on on actual exchange of property. So it became much more based on uh, you know, the market system and capitalism and entrepreneurship and the whole idea of manufactured goods and so on. That created a new legal system. The property system really replaced feudalism. In now in our current area, we're going to go through a similar change, a property-based system. Again, the idea that you know, the exchange of goods and services in an open market and the legal systems that support that we're really moving much more toward, and I don't really have a good name for it yet. I used to, on the slide earlier, I called it a, a sort of the collaboration model of law, but then people thought I was a socialist, so I took that off. Now I call it the network version of law, where somehow we need a sort of new legal system that's founded in the idea that information is a very different kind of commodity than oil and steel and farm commodities. Again, because you know, I use that barrel of oil, that means you don't use it. When I'm done with it, it's gone. All those kinds of things really are at the heart of the, of the sort of property system of law. Information doesn't follow any of those rules. Uh, and therefore, the kinds of, of, um, of legal system we need to support an information economy is going to be very different. Uh, what it's going to look like, well, I tried to organize the book around what I thought of as the three biggest areas of change. So obviously, Private law has to do with our interaction as, as consumers or as citizens, certainly as individuals, so things like privacy, uh, things like uh, civil rights, human rights, government surveillance, and so on, uh, things that happen at the intersection uh, between um, uh, the physical world and the, and the digital world. That's sort of the first section of the book. The middle section of the book, I talk more about, about uh, public life, in particular, um, the sort of regulation of business, the regulation of competition, antitrust is one, uh, the actual infrastructure itself, so everything having to do with regulation of the internet or all the companies that provide uh, access and, and infrastructure and, uh, and the backbone. And then, of course, uh, crime, both personal uh, and uh, business crime, uh, identity theft and spam and things of that nature. Uh, again, what's a, what's a more appropriate kind of legal structure to respond to that than, you know, the one that we have, which obviously doesn't work. Can't call the law. Actually, I, I live in a very small, just brief aside, I live in a very small piece of unincorporated Contra Costa County uh, just north of Berkeley, uh, the little town called Kensington, 500 uh, residents. Uh, and you get the little uh, monthly newspaper and it gives you sort of the whole police blot blotter. We have a little police force. A couple uh, part-time officers, and every you know most of it is oh somebody left their car unlocked and CDs were taken out or somebody left their garage unlocked lost some tools. Every now and then there's a reference in the blotter to you know police took a call from resident of such and such street uh, that they had been the victim of identity theft. Uh, now you actually have to do that because your insurance company requires you to file a police report if you're going to make a claim. But just imagine again the two officers. Uh, Part-time officers in Kensington, California, you know, yes, I've been a victim of identity theft. You know, we're going to get right on it. What on earth could they possibly do? You know, there's just the mismatch between the skill sets, the tools, the jurisdiction, everything about a local police force in a town of 500 and a sort of a global enterprise that's just, you know, great, okay, you know, duly, duly noted. All right. So the third area, uh, which obviously is, is, is amongst the, the most contentious, what I call information life. And this is, you know, really at the heart of it. This is the sort of legal system that's evolving to deal with this new economy, which is based on information, which again, follows a lot of economic rules that are very different than what we're used to from scarce goods like oil and, and corn and so on. So obviously everything having to do 
uh, with copyright and patent and particularly with the law of software or information products themselves. This is the, you know, sort of central to the message of, of the book. Um, we know, I mean, you, you know this far better than I do, that these are areas uh, of great contention and, of course, the sort of escalation of problems that happens kind of matches, again, the Moore's Law curve. The faster things change, the more, you know, you, if, you're, if you're thinking next year it's going to quiet down, you are not looking at the chart correctly. Uh, one thing you will know for certain is that there will be more conflicts next year and there will be more conflicts the year after that. Ultimately, you know, we will evolve some new way of regulating information that will make better sense. I'm not criticizing the copyright system. It was fine for what it was invented to do. It just doesn't work in a digital, non-media-based information exchange market. It's just, it's not, wasn't designed to do it, so it's not like anybody should be uh, blamed or, or yelled at, uh, but it doesn't work. And we know it doesn't work. And every, there's one thing everybody agrees on. You get a bunch of you know, patent lawyers in a room together, and the one thing they will all agree on is that the patent system is completely broken. Um, and in fact, you, get, you pretty quickly get them to agree, at least half of them, to agree on what the solution would be. That is, the, the ones from information technology companies have a pretty good idea of the fix. And unfortunately, the ones from the pharmaceutical companies have a completely different idea of what the fix is. And frankly, the reason that there has been no significant patent reform in Europe or the United States over the last 10 years is because essentially you've got two competing bills every year that come up. They say, no, we're going to do the pharma fix, and we're going to do the IT fix, and they wind up doing nothing. Uh, so everybody knows it's broken uh, and, and that it's not, you know, it's not meeting any of the goals or expectations that we have for it. But the chances, uh, I just was at uh, CES in Las Vegas last week at a, at a policy conference, uh, and um, uh, Congressman uh, Issa from uh, Southern California uh, said uh, the chances for patent reform next year are, are not only zero, but for the next three years uh, are, are completely zero. Uh, and by the way, the result of that is that, that when things break, if the law doesn't fix them, where do you go? Who, who fixes it if, if the legislature doesn't fix it? What's the sort of the backstop? Yeah, the court. So, you know, if something goes wrong and the law isn't fixed, you, you sue and you go to court. And what we have in the patent system as well as uh, in a lot of these other systems is we have the worst institutionally the worst uh, group of all, you know, sort of judges and so on. Not that they're bad people, but they're the ones who are least able to, they don't do fact finding, right? They, when they have to make a decision, it's supposed to be based just on that particular set of facts and, and circumstances. But of course, it winds up having broader implications. Uh, and so I by default, we get lawmaking by the courts and by, by judicial decisions. Nobody thinks that's a good idea. I mean, think about poor Judge Green uh, running the communications network of the United States from his chambers after the AT&T uh, divestiture case uh, in the 70s uh, until Congress, no, the 80s, sorry, until Congress passed the 1996 Communications Act, poor Judge Green was running the communications uh, business of the entire United States out of his judicial chambers. It was just, a ho I mean, and he was the, believe me, it was not a job that he wanted or enjoyed, but because he was responsible for enforcing the antitrust decree and because Congress didn't pass any legislation until 1996, he ran it for 10 years. Uh, nothing, and, you know, and we know that those were not good 10 years for communications, right? We had separate you know, companies that were only allowed to do data and other companies were only allowed to do voice. And uh, all of that became so artificial uh, as, the, as Moore's Law did its thing that you know, the system just became uh, unworkable. Well, finally, anyway. There was some movement. At least it's out of the courts. Now it's back in, in Congress. So I thought what I would do, I'm going to leave some time for questions, but I thought I would just say a little bit in particular, uh, just to give sort of one example from the, the book of how I think this breakdown occurs and then a way going forward, is to look at intellectual property broadly. Obviously, that's uh, probably the, the area here that's of most uh, interest to, uh, to Google. And again, to look at historically how disruptive technologies have created these kinds of legal crises and then sort of what eventually gets uh, evolved or what eventually is created to try to come up with a, a legal system that much better fits the physics of the technology, what technology has created, what, what technology has wrought. So you go back, I think, to sort of obviously the most important technological development uh, in information, uh, certainly uh, uh, before the computer, uh, was the printing press, movable type and so on, Gutenberg, uh, 1450. And one of the things you realize right away was there's an agenda here that's much more important than just the business agenda, right? So why did Gutenberg invent movable type? 
what was his actual goal? Was he you know, selling books? He wanted to you know, make, make money as a bookseller? Well, in part, but here's a quote from, from Gutenberg uh, about the importance of the printing press. And one of the things you realize is that he had uh, a much broader social goal, in this case, a religious goal. Gutenberg uh, was a Lutheran, uh, and one of the ten tenets of Lutheranism of the whole Protestant revolution was that the church, you know, if you sort of think about it, the Catholic church in the Middle Ages was kind of like Microsoft uh, Windows. It was sort of a closed environment. Um, there were little bits of API, but that was about it. You really couldn't, uh, you know, the, the, it was in Latin. You couldn't get educated in Latin. The priests really controlled information and how it was used, and that, that essentially their competitive strategy was to limit access to information as a way of keeping their customers uh, coming back for more. Uh, Luther turned that upside down and said, no, you know, give the information away. So he was the open source guy. He said, give the information away and find technologies that will do that and you will wind up with creating more value for yourself than by keeping it closed. So it was really, you know, it was very much the kind of same fight uh, that we have today. In this case, and I frankly think historically in all cases, the open model ultimately wins. In this case, there were 300 years of, of war uh, to, uh, to sort of resolve the problem. But ultimately, the open model wins, uh, largely because the technology makes that inevitable. Um, so there's Gutenberg in 1455. Um, and as the sort of pretty press, so as we had, you know, this sort of revolution, one of the things we realized, again, in a closed society, we didn't have to have rules about copying manuscripts because that copying was so closely controlled by the, the owner of the manuscript that it was just irrelevant. But as the printing press evolved and as we continued to get more from uh, liturgical books to secular books, it became clear that there needed to be rules about who could do what and that the sort of economics of this were very important. So exactly 300 years, this is the 300th anniversary of the very first copyright statute, the British uh, Statute of Anne. And the copyright says, you know, it's still really the basis for copyright law today, this idea that we're going to encourage authorship, we're going to encourage the creation of information by using this very clever hack, which is to say, we're going to temporarily give a monopoly power to the person who originates new information, and there's lots of limits on what you can originate, you know, you, not all information gets this monopoly power. Right? If I, write down my, my directions to my house, that's not, doesn't get controlled by copyright. But if I create some interesting information, some useful information uh, with some sort of significant addition to, to human life, I will get a monopoly power to control its distribution, the Catholic model, but only for a certain period of time after which the whole thing reverses. It goes into what we call the public domain. Anybody can do whatever they want with it, the Protestant model. And the idea here was that this would give the incentives for more information creation and at the same time make sure that we were feeding the ultimate goal of as much information flow as possible. The Statute of Anne set its own uh, set of rules. Well, obviously, uh, what's happened over the years is that the technology for both creating and distributing information has changed. And in response, the laws had to change, you know, make sure to keep that balance, or at least the goal is to keep that balance. The law keeps changing in response. The problem, of course, has been that over the last 100 years, the pace at which these new developments come in that upset the balance just gets faster and faster, and the law still takes a long time to, so it gets smaller, it's further and further behind. So you start to look at a number of sort of major radical disruptive technologies, each of which so upset the balance that a major reform was ultimately needed. Uh, Beta, you know, 1995, uh, obviously in terms of, of music and entertainment now uh, in 2001. And what do you, th what one of the things I think, you know, that's pretty clear, whoops, I, I missed a chart, um, is, oh, I see, I must have left it out. All right, so one of the things you, th you find that's pretty clear is that the, the system is, as, you know, so the sort of pace of change has outstripped the pace of reform to the system, and now it doesn't work at all. Uh, what we've got, of course, now is a system where instead of recognizing that information is cheaper to create and cheaper to distribute, uh, we've done the exact opposite. The, the length of copyright and the, the, the kinds of enforcement and the civil and cr now criminal penalties for copyright infringement have become more stringent even as the cost of creation and distribution has gone down. Of course, the cost of, of privacy has also gone down, but that's the only thing that the law so far seems to respond to. It doesn't respond to these other features. And the analogy I use to talk about copyright is essentially it's as if every time cars got faster, we lowered the speed limit on the freeway in response, you know, because we want to make sure there are fewer accidents. So that's, that's certainly one goal. 
Uh, the problem is that as we've done that, uh, the cars get faster and the speed limit goes down. And basically, we now have a freeway where the speed limit is one mile an hour. Uh, what happens when you have uh, a law that's completely unrealistic to reality is nobody obeys it. And so effectively, you know, we have a copyright system and, you know, for all intents and purposes, it has no, va no, base, no value in terms of how people behave. It doesn't affect their decision to do, do one thing or another thing. Uh, you know, you can pick off individuals every now and then through litigation. The, the bottom line is that the, the system is now without a governing body of law. It's kind of, you know, the market is setting certain rules and, and certain terms. And again, every now and then there's a piece of litigation. So obviously the, the, the Google Viacom case uh, still pending is an attempt to try and, you know, enforce the one mile an hour speed limit on a 55, you know, mile an hour vehicle. Um, ultimately, those things may have some influence, but really what's determining the law of copyright today or the, the use of information today has nothing to do with the copyright law. It has everything to do with the, the market forces. Um, and, and just to, to sort of close it up, in, uh, you know, in my copyright chapter, I sort of said, well, here's three what I think of as modest reforms. Again, they're kind of in the, in the Brooks Adams model of things. What could we actually do? Uh, by the way, there's absolutely no chance any of these things would happen uh, in, in Congress uh, today anyway, uh, but not because nobody thinks they're a good idea, just because the, the political will wouldn't be there. But in fact, if we wanted to actually turn the copyright system into something that worked in the digital economy, I think you know, sort of three things that would have a great deal of uh, help there. One would be to sort of dial back on the, on the extension of copyright, sort of put it back to a reasonable term, reasonable enforcement, reasonable penalties, that people will maybe obey a law that they think makes a certain amount of sense. Uh, restoring the concept of fair use, of uses that don't have to be licensed. Licensing is, can be a very expensive and time-consuming process, or as economists would say, have lots of transaction costs. Uh, and we've uh, judicially eliminated fair use in a series of decisions in this country over the last 10 years. Many of the things that people sue about today, uh, they wouldn't have to sue about or they wouldn't sue about because effectively they should be covered by this kind of general free license of fair use. Uh, if we put that back in the law, we would avoid a lot of the conflict right away. And then thirdly, many of the features of the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, passed in 2000, uh, particularly ones that, that, uh, that make it you know, illegal to reverse engineer uh, DRM and some of the other more draconian features of DMCA, uh, take those out. Uh, those three things, I think, would, would, would kind of be the Granger version of copyright reform as opposed to what we've got now, which is the Russian Revolution version of copyright reform. And as I say, there's, you know, there's, no, there's no Theodore Roosevelt on the horizon <laughs> that I know of uh, who's going to make that happen. But, you know, if the conflict gets uh, increasingly hostile, uh, maybe somebody uh, will come up and do that. All right, so I'm going to stop. Oh, wait. So, yeah, I'll leave it here. This is just sort of... Uh, the, the cheat sheet if you, for questions, this is kind of uh, a bunch of current issues and the thumbs up is, you know, thumbs down, kind of my view, my viewpoint on them. Uh, my viewpoint in this case always coming from kind of the general theory I just laid out for you. Uh, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense uh, kind of generates, I think, the thumbs up and thumbs down. But uh, I'll stop there and we can just sort of talk about whatever you want, take any, any questions on any subject, this or otherwise, uh, that you'd like. So I'm going to stop there and see if there's any questions. Okay, former students are required to ask a question. Um, I remember. Um, I remember when you came out with your first book, you put it all online, unleashing the killer app. A lot has happened between what, I don't know, what, 1999 back then mm -hmm. and now. Are you doing that now with your new book and? What are your thoughts on that? Um, so the a short answer is no. Um, I didn't put, and one of the reasons I was able to put, so the Killer App book, uh, when we launched, this was 1998 uh, actually, when it came out, we had a website where we literally put the entire book online for free. You know, it was, the, we used a tool that made it so you could only read kind of a section at a time or a chapter at a time. So it wasn't really, if you wanted to read the whole book online, you could, but it wasn't really easy to print it out and make, but we didn't, and of course, the only way we were able to get away with that was that our publisher didn't understand that that was possible. And frankly, didn't know that we had done it until too late. Uh, the cat was out of the bag. Well, now publishers are much more sophisticated about that. So I was not able to do that um, with this book. But what I have done, uh, and actually I'm learning a lot from the process is that, that 
since you know, about a month or two before the book came out, I've started blogging and I put myself on a, a pretty aggressive schedule of at least two significant posts a week. And my posts, they turn out, not, they turn, they turn out more to be like articles. So they're like 1,000 to 1,500 words each, which is, you know, breaks all the rules of blogging. Uh, they're very long posts, but I'm trying to sort of keep up with things that have happened since I stopped writing the manuscript. And effectively, if you read my blog, I've now written more words on the blog than the manuscript, uh, the text of the book. So I've actually written the next book. Um, it's not organized, it's sort of just by topics, but the, the, in terms of word count, I've now put up again online for free more content than, than, than isn't actually in the, in the book itself. That's the closest I could come. Right, um, I, I had a question as well. I, I, uh, uh -huh. I really enjoyed the, um, the, the parallels you made with the, the railroad company and Theodore Roosevelt. Um, in, in today's society, with all the collaboration that's going on on the internet and how things are really crowdsourced, do you think it, it is going to take another Theodore Roosevelt, or is it going to take like a, a Theodore Roosevelt network of like-minded believers to, to change things? Well, so as I said, you know, it depends on what route ultimately we go. We go the, the, the progressive route or we go the revolutionary route. Uh, as I say, right now it's a revolution. So far it's a nonviolent revolution, but it's nonetheless, uh, you know, you can sort of, it's not too far to think of, of uh, people, um, you know, there, there, there are many public advocacy groups uh, in, in Washington and sort of their followers. You know, they use pretty violent uh, rhetoric, at least, when they start talking about some of these issues. Uh, and it's not sort of far to think, you know, people are going to the, going to the barricades for copyright reform. Uh, it seems kind of uh, foolish to think of that now, but I suggest in five years, if we haven't made any changes to the law, uh, that won't sound quite so uh, ridiculous. So if we are going to go the correct way, the progressive way, uh, yeah, of course, you know, the idea, you know, how do we develop a new law? Well, we obviously are going to use the tools available. So we're going to develop it on Wikipedia and Facebook and Google. I mean, we will use... You know, just as the Facebook little rebellion used Facebook to, to, um, to integrate, we will use the exact same collaborative model for developing what seemed like a better set of rules and therefore a better set of, of, of code, a better set of principles for governing our digital life. That, that, seems, that seems quite straightforward. The tools are there. Now the question is, you know, are the ideas there and is the ability to implement and enforce them and kind of keep traditional governments out of the way in the process? Uh, is that there? That's that's the the sixty four thousand dollar question. So the first thing I noticed on this chart was the thumbs thumbs down for network neutrality. Yeah, and and uh, uh, many others may may uh, may have noticed that as well. well. Could you elaborate a bit on that? Sure. So I have this is about half a chapter of the book where I talk about um, infrastructure in particular, but net neutrality. So uh, I should say I'm not <laughs> I'm not opposed to net neutrality, at least the principles of net neutrality. Um, my concern, and it should be f fairly obvious now why that would be, is uh, particularly with the idea that it would be both implemented and enforced by the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, the idea, again, here that a, that a terrestrial, you know, sort of earthbound governing body, in this case one with an extremely poor track record uh, for dealing with information, if you think about, uh, you know, th this day, right, the FCC, you know, they, because their jurisdiction allows them to deal with content on the broadcast network, only they can't they can't really enforce their views on on the cable network on on satellite, but on broadcast they can. And so you know you have literally you know sort of the FCC trolling around looking for errant nipples and swear words, and this is sort of kind of you know really nanny behavior that not only hasn't been toned down, it's actually you know the the number of enforcements and the the number of the size of the penalties has actually gone up. So you know this is an agency where it's wearing its its a content manager hat that has not given us reason to believe they, they get what 21st century life is really about. Uh, so my concern about it is, as I say, principally the FCC, you know, sort of any traditional uh, physical government, but particularly the FCC, is an awful place to not only to divine the rules, but then uh, my concern is particularly around enforcement. Uh, if somebody says, okay, so let's say they, the, the rules get passed, uh, and uh, under one version of them, any person in the world, any citizen of the United States, can file a complaint with the FCC uh, if they think the rules are being violated. The FCC must investigate within 180 days. And let's say that's what goes into effect. So you can sort of imagine the, the situation is, um, I'm at home, my cable seems really slow, the Internet's really slow today, I bet, you know, that, that Comcast is messing with the traffic, and I'm going to file a complaint with the FCC, and they're required to investigate it. 
Um, you know, and how are they going to investigate it? Well, there's very little, so there's been very, there's, there's sort of a lot of written about it that's, um, that's from the lawyer standpoint. There's very, sorry, there's very little that's been written about it from the engineering standpoint. What's the engineering behind how the FCC would investigate and enforce the rules, assuming that they're the ones charged with that authority? Well, uh, they're going to have, it seems to me, uh, that at least one likely way and therefore the way that the FCC would most prefer is that they're going to have to have access to the traffic. Uh, not necessarily, you know, looking at all the packets, but they're going to have to say, all right, we're going to do a compliance check or we're going to do an audit, and we're going to look at what packets we're moving at the time this complaint uh, uh, takes place, and we're going to look to see if we see any indication of non-neutral behavior. Was it just the traffic was slow because the traffic was slow, or was the traffic slow because the application I was using was BitTorrent or some other, you know, deep, deep preferred application. Well, the only way they're going to really be able to determine that is to look at at least some of the traffic, put it back together, and the minute the FCC is doing deep packet inspection is the minute that, that the, I, ex I would expect the civil libertarians to get the most upset. Uh, because, of course, they're looking at it for one purpose, which is to see if the wrong kind of stuff is being favored or disfavored, but, you know, this is the federal government. Now, I'm not as paranoid as many of these groups are, but you'd think that the more paranoid ones would be saying, oh, well, the minute the FCC starts doing deep packet inspection, well, they're going to look for other interesting things they find, and of course the war on terror, most of it done secretly, uh, they will turn over lots and lots of what they find as they look inside. You know, this is a worst case scenario. I don't necessarily think, don't necessarily think that makes it an unlikely scenario, uh, and I worry about that tremendously. So those sort of law of unintended consequences with the rules and the problems of enforcement uh, are why I'm, I'm strongly opposed to the FCC having the authority to, to make sure net neutrality. Net neutrality is fine. The FCC in charge of it, not so fine. Okay. Yeah, we're done, right? Time's up. Cool, yeah, I think we're, we're about all set, but I want to thank you again for coming to speak with us today. An outstanding presentation. Thank you. Thank you, my pleasure.